So this is our unit test review. We had five sections. Uh, we learned some pretty tough concepts in this unit, so I would definitely sp uh, spend some time studying some of these things. Uh, for example, understanding how array lists are set up, making sure you know the correct syntax for that, making sure you know the correct syntax for for loops. Both of those things are things that have to be memorized. The syntax for an array list, the syntax for a for loop. Know the methods that are built into the array list uh, that you have to know that are in the list. We'll go over those shortly. How is a class set up and the constructors that are within that class. Remember, I encourage you to use the this operator when you're building constructors. You have a constructor that is just a generic, which has no uh, parameters in it, and it refers to a constructor that has all of the parameters in it. So it's using the this operator inside that constructor to point to another constructor and populate it with some default values, like no author or no title or something like that. And finally, we also talked about static classes. Uh, the math class is an example of a static class where, excuse me, not static class. It's actually a static method. Static classes are actually something different. But a static method where you can use the class name to call the method. You don't have to create an object. Uh, we use static variables to create counters to keep track of, for example, the number of books so we can create some unique IDs for those books. But the other advantage of using a static method is you don't have to create an object to use that static method. You could just use the name of the class. So, for example, in our book class, if we had uh, a method that printed out the number of books, you know, it would just be print uh, book numbers or print total books. You could say book dot print total books. You would never have to actually create a book to get at that information. You just use the title of the class. And that's the advantage of having a static method, is that you have that access. And there's an example of that inside. So let's dive in a little bit and take a little bit deeper. That was our 30,000 foot view. So um, this is right from the notes. Uh, an array list is a collection of objects. It can only store objects. It can't store anything else. That's an important fact to know. Uh, it's similar to an array, but it only holds references but it also has several methods that are associated with it that allows us to change its size. We can add items and remove items. Uh, those built-in methods make life a little bit easier. So to declare an array list, there are two ways of doing it, actually technically three ways, but this is the way you would declare it without a type. In other words, if you're not saying what's going into that array list, this is the way you would declare it. Array list, the name of the list, equals new array list or you could declare a size for that array list in which case it would be populated with null objects so it would be 10 null objects in most cases though we want to declare what's actually in it we want to say that there are strings in it we want to say that there are books in it we want to say that what kind of object is in that array list so most times we won't use this uh, this is very generic, and it causes problems when we try to pull things out of the list because we don't exactly know what's in that list. This is the better way of declaring it, putting in what we're going to put in that list. So we add in this uh, string modifier that says it's an array list of strings. It's called breeds. Uh, it's a new array list, and again, we're saying what's inside of it. You have to put it in both places, otherwise you're going to get an error. So you have to put it here. Uh, right after the word array list, and again, you have to put it here, right after the word array list. I'm not sure exactly why they have to have them in both places, it's just do. Um, it sounds like something that should have been taken care of at some point in some version, but they didn't. You just have to put it in both places. So we have our methods that adds items, breeds.adds, boxers, doc, uh, docs, and poodles. If you tried to add something that's not a string, then uh, you could end up with problems at that point unless there's a two-string method and it will convert it to a string. But I don't think you'll have to, you won't have to deal with that on the test. So, what methods do you have to know? You have to know the dot add method, which adds an element to the end of the list. You have to know the dot add 
at a particular location, which inserts the item at that location and shifts everything else out of the way. You have to know the dot set item, which resets a value at a particular location. So don't confuse these two. Dot add adds something to the list. Dot set essentially replaces something that's already in the list without changing the size. Dot get returns the value at the list. So if you want to get an item in the list, that's different than the way we deal with arrays. Arrays, you just say the name of the array, a bracket, and then a number dealing with the index. Here, we actually have to use a method call, dot get. And then finally, dot remove, removes an element for the list. Those are the ones you have to know. Some of the other ones that are useful are dot clear, which gets everything out of the list and sets it back to having nothing in it, makes it an empty list. So that's sometimes useful as well. But these are the ones you have to know for the AP exam, so these are the ones you have to know for the test. So these are the other handy methods that you don't have to know, but they are useful. Uh, List.size returns the size. Dot contains says if there's anything in there. And dot clear, of course, clears the entire list. So these two in particular are very useful. So they may not be required for the AP exam, but you might end up finding yourself using them anyway. You know, it's, it's often useful to know the size of the array if you're going to do a for loop as opposed to doing a for each loop will refer to again. Uh, and also it's nice to be able to search an array list to see if something is inside of it. It's a lot easier than doing a dot equals and comparing things. You could just do a dot contains and never have to traverse the entire list. Otherwise you'd have to build some type of for loop, go through the, the, the list one thing at a time, comparing it with a dot equals. So I encourage you to know these as well just because it's going to make your life easier when you're writing code for the AP exam. So next, lesson two, we talked about the for each loop, which goes hand in hand with array lists. That's different than the for loop. So this is the syntax for a for each loop. You say a um, variable that you're going to use with the type, just like what we do with a for loop, right? With a for loop, we would say in die, now we're saying string b, or book b, whatever it is that's stored inside that uh, array list you would list there. And then you put the colon after the variable name. And then you put the name of the array list, or the collection. Uh, this works with any kind of collection. Right now, you guys only know one kind of collection called array lists. Later on, as you get more into Java, there are other kinds of collections not covered by the AP exam. So there is more to Java than just what we're doing. Then uh, we're just going to print them out. So this will go through every item in the book's array list, store it, each item temporarily in the variable B, and then you can print it out or do whatever you want with it. So here's a bigger view of that the uh, setup there. So you list the type, some variable to hold each piece of data, a colon, and then the name of the array list or whatever the collection is. So again, the differences between the for loops and the for each loops is the for loops do this X number of times. So there's a certain specific number of times to do it. The for each loop says do this for every item in the collection. So one is dependent upon some counter. The other one is dependent upon how many things are in the collection. For loop, each loops avoids the one-off errors where you accidentally walk off the edge of the list because you don't have to know how many items are in the list. You just have to have a list and it'll automatically go through it. Often we'll get lists that don't have some way of determining their size. You might have a list that some collection, I mean there are other types of collections that you may not know the size of it. And using a for each loop makes that easier because you don't need to know the size of it. It's just keep going until you don't have anything else to look at. Okay, um, we talked about this error. You can't remove an item from a for each loop in the array list because it shifts everything. When you remove something, everything moves around. 
So you can't pull something out of an array list with a for each loop because a for each loop is counting itself, keeping track of itself. It has no index to move it along. With a for loop, you can remove things, but if you do it with a for loop in an array list, you have to remove it from the end, which means you have to traverse the list backwards. If you remove it from the beginning, everything shifts up. So everything moves again. So the, the way things get deleted from an array list, everything shifts. Unless you're moving from the end, then there's nothing to shift. You know, there's no space to fill. You just cut it off the tail. So you have to be careful of that if you need to create some type of loop where you're going to remove items from a list. In general, it's bad practice. Don't remove items from a list unless you absolutely have to. Do it outside the loop. Maybe find the location of the item to be removed uh, using some type of flag system. You know, find the you know, location found, add location, then after the loop, then do dot remove location. And then you're set. It's all okay, everything can shift, it's not a problem. It only becomes a problem when you're doing it inside the loop, when you're doing that remove command. So this is a no-no. Just don't do the dot remove command inside of a loop, and it will make coding a lot easier. Make it a practice to do it outside the loop, finding the index as you go through the loop. So, lesson three, the basics of a class. A couple class basics. It has to be stored in the same folder. Uh, it has to have the same file name as the class name. We want to declare it public class and just have two curly cues. This is the absolute minimum you need to have to make a class. Classes by themselves don't run. You need some type of driver program to run that. So when you're loading it, you have to have two things going, one that has a public static void main, one main class, and then this other class that you're going to use and build. Uh, this is for your main class, and we want to construct a new object from our book class. We do book, we identify what it is, some variable equals new book, and that should be a lowercase n. And then it refers back to the book class, but right now there's no constructor, so nothing's actually going to happen, but this would work. This would load, this would run. Nothing really gets created other than a reference in memory to a basically empty object. Better version of this is we declare some data, also called properties. These variables are private to keep encapsulation um, for the class. The only way to access that information is through an accessor method. The only way to change the information is through a mutator method. So our constructors are a good example of mutator methods. We use those to build our object. So it takes three parameters. That matches with the three pieces of data that we need to update. And we just do an assignment. But then we talked about there are better ways of doing this. Instead of doing title equals T, we want to refractor that to a set title method in case later on we need to change the title. And we want to refractor the author to a set author method in case later we want to change the author or change the year. Then we also talked about uh, a two-string method. Every object has a built-in two-string method that just returns the random reference information about it. So we want to modify that, technically called um, overriding. So we're going to override the, the original two-string method to put our own version in. We'll talk more about overriding in another lesson. So an object has variables and it has methods. Variables are the state, the conditions of the objects, the methods are the behaviors. The class is like the template, the blueprint. You have a blueprint, from the blueprint you build houses. Many different houses. Different initial conditions for those different houses. So they take different parameters. So the constructor, the constructors, the guys building the house, need to know what parameters do you want. Right? You know, what arguments are you going to send to our parameters? What size kitchen is it? Or is it, is it the kitchen with the upgraded appliances or not? So all those things go in as arguments into the parameters, and then they go ahead and they build the house based upon what you say. So an object is an instance of a class. Important vocabulary word. An 
object is an instance of a class. Important vocabulary word. Instantiation is when we create a variable in memory that holds an object. That process. The instantiation of an object. Again, important vocabulary word, just, just different tense or what do they call that? Verb versus noun. The constructor is the thing that builds things in uh, memory. We'll have more about that in the next lesson. So, constructor builds an object, new ref returns the reference to the newly created object that gets stored in the and we had an example with the coin class where we had public coin side equals 1. We had our two string method and then we added a nice little flip class there that allows us to flip the coin. Or, excuse me, flip method returns nothing, just flips the method. Then we said, hey, maybe we should refactor this, so that way instead of setting side equal to 1, we could just call flip. So we kind of made it better. Um, public versus private. Public means it can be used by any program that has access to the class. Private means it can only be used by the class itself. So all the data should always be private. Any methods that you build that are helper methods or decomposing methods, which we'll talk more about later, uh, should stay private. Only methods that you want the user to have access to or the other programmer when you give your software to them should be public. Those are the only methods that should be public. And we did an example of that. So, accessors and mutators. Accessors allow you to access the data. Those are the public methods that allow you to get the information out. Mutators are the public methods that allow you to change the data. There should be no other way of accessing or changing the data. Java doesn't care if you allow people to have access to your data directly. Java doesn't care, they let you do it. The style guidelines for Java say you should not do that. So we have that dichotomy between style and what Java lets you do. Java will let you fall on your face, it doesn't care. Let you do whatever you think you want to do. Built it allows you to, to have that flexibility. But style guidelines say unless there's a really good reason, everything should be encapsulated. Everything should be private, and you use mutators and accessors. Okay. That's it for that. Let's dive into lesson four constructors, which you know go along with lesson three nicely. So clearly we've already had to talk about constructors in order to talk about class basics, but now we're going to go more into the fact that you can have more than one constructor. Uh, this is called um, method overloading, if you recall, where we're having the same name method and just having different signatures. So in um, when we're building our constructor, we said it would be a good idea to refactor the code so that way we're using methods to change our data so that way we don't have to do it more than once we don't want to just say year equals y we want to say set year why because we might want to change that information later make it more complicated we might and then we only have to change it one slot we don't have to change it for every single method that uses the setting year method uh, here's an example of using the constructor other changes we talked about is maybe doing an uppercase in the title, method overloading. This is the real nitty-gritty of the lesson here. So we have uh, the this operator. So we have three constructors here. Let's go through this slowly here. First one's book. Second one's book with a signature of a single string. Third one is a book with a signature of two strings and an integer. The first two constructors refer to this constructor down here using the this operator by the method of method overloading. The way this process works, Java gets a call to book with a signature of nothing. So somewhere in a driver class you do book b equals new book, parenthesis, parenthesis. So this method gets identified. Inside here, Java sees the word this. 
this always refers to the thing that the line of code is in. The class that the line of code is in. So you can substitute the word this for the word book. You might be saying, well, not, why not just say book? Because there's other cases. We talk about inheritance. You'll understand better why we don't say things like that. This makes it very clear. The class that you're in. Not by name. It's the thing that you're in. As I'm handing it to you, the thing that's in my hand. This. Very clear what it is. So it says book, and then with this signature, two strings and an integer, it knows to go down here to this constructor, two strings and an integer, using that signature. The second constructor here takes uh, has a signature of one string. So if I in my driver class say book, my book equals new parentheses quotes the life and times of Mr. McLaughlin quotes parentheses. Java will then say, okay, this is the constructor I'm going to use because it has a signature with one string. It says this. I'm going to send the title to the constructor called book that has three um, parameters. I'm going to send the title, an unknown author, and an unknown year. Or 1450 in this case. Send that all, and then set title, set author, and set year take over. So these two constructors are feeding this one. So why do we refractor code? Why are we calling one constructor from um, another is because it's cleaner, it's easier, uh, it's less code to write, less likely to make mistakes. We only have one thing to change. That's the major reason for having this uh, overloaded method using the this operator. Because we can then go ahead and just change the final constructor if we need to fix something. And it fixes it for everything. Like when we decided to add a book number. We didn't have to change the other two constructors. We could just add an additional signature because those other two constructors all call that one. And every book is going to have a book number. And it has nothing to do with what the user sends. Every book just automatically gets it. So we only had to change that third constructor to include a book number. So we created a static variable, which we'll go to in the next um, lesson real quick. So finally, lesson five, static classes. I'm going to just look at this example here because this is the best summative version of this. So in this example here, we have a static variable called count. It gets initialized to zero. We have an, a mutator method that increments it. We have a, a static value that gets the count, which means we can access it directly with the name of the class. We can do variable demo dot get count. That gives us the value immediately. In addition, the counter is the same for every object. So if we have object one and object two and we're using get count, it's the same method. It's the same piece of data they're accessing. They're sharing that piece of data that is the counter. So no matter how many objects I create, that counter will just keep incrementing until you know I decide to stop creating objects. So everybody has access to that one piece of information, so that's static variable. So I encourage you to really kind of go through and look at this code example to help you identify and understand static variables. That that's it for the test review. Good luck on the test. Never stop coding.